conception of God most prevalent in Western societies is highly anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic means the unjustified projection of human qualities onto things that are not human. The Western conception of God, a concept invented by ancient desert tribes and refined somewhat over the years and made intellectually respectable by Descartes, uh, consists in forming an image of a being with human qualities. Some of these qualities are magnifying indefinitely. God is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good, while others are not, where God is imagined to be emotionally affected by what we do, where God is pleased or displeased with us in the same way in which we are pleased or displeased with others. When people, including philosophers and theologians, ask whether the existence of God can be proven, they generally mean to ask whether this image, which they have formed in their minds, can be proven to correspond to anything in reality, that is to say, to anything outside their imagination. The fact that this image of God has no existence outside the imagination means that God does not exist, but that the image of God is like Santa Claus of fiction. So we must form a different, non-anthropomorphic conception of God, a conception form uh, which God existence will follow necessarily. Indeed, the fact that it is possible to doubt whether the Judeo-Christian God or concept of God exists is in itself a reason to question the adequacy of that particular conception. We see a conception of God, a definition of God, from which her existence follows in much the same way that the non-existence of married bachelors follows from the definition of the terms married and bachelor. This procedure is generally referred to as the ontological proof for the existence of God. It's the attempt to prove that the existence of God follows from the concept of God or from the meaning of the term God. Such proofs have generally failed because philosophers have held to an inadequate concept, uh, conception of God. A criterion for an adequate concept of God is that his existence follows immediately from the definition of the concept. We will give two definitions of God and then show that they are equivalent to one another. That is, that both definitions define the same concept. The reason for giving two definitions at once is that the first is logically more fundamental, but the existence of God is easier to see right away from the second. You see from one, we have God is equal to or is defined as an independent being, or a being the existence of which does not depend on anything other than itself. And two, God is defined as the totality of everything there is, or simply all that is. God's existence follows immediately from the second definition. For anyone who claims to doubt whether God, as so defined, ex defined exists, has simply not understood the definition. No one can doubt that everything that exists does not in fact exist. This is simply a tautology. What, of course, is the difference here, and what requires further elaboration, is the appropriateness of defining the term God in this way. Therefore, we will discuss the more usual definition of God, from definition 1, and show that it leads logically to definition 2. For now, the reader should reflect that uh, defining God as all that is does indeed necessitate the existence of God thus defined and that no other definition of God that does not entail definition to has this consequence. Before considering the first definition of God, I want to make very clear that the immense difference between Spinoza's conception of God and the more popular Judeo-Christian concept of God, the difference between these two concepts is more apparent when one considers the, the question, what is the relation between God on the one hand and creation or the world on the other? The familiar Judeo-Christian concept conceives of God as wholly other than the world, much as the sculptor is different from the sculpture he creates, or the watchmaker is different from the watch he is, he is making. So God, like the watchmaker, is conceived as making the world, winding it up, so to speak, yet remaining other than and external to the created world. The Spinozistic conception of God, on the contrary, holds that the world is internal to God, that this can be expressed in many ways. 
there is nothing but God. God creates the world out of himself. The world is a part of God. The world is a manifestation of God. Nothing is external to God. God has no outside. God is one with respect to which there is no other, and all things are in God, and so forth. Thus, the physical universe as a whole may be thought of quite literally as constituting the body of God, to which Spinoza gives the name extension. This is a three-dimensional or contemporary four-dimensional extension. Similarly, the mental universe as a whole, which includes our minds, but is not limited to human minds, constitutes the mind of God, to which Spinoza gives the name thought or cognition. It follows from this that we ourselves, body and mind, are constituted by and from a part of the very fabric of God. The difference between these two conceptions of the relation between God and the world cannot be overemphasized. On the Judeo-Christian account, the human being is totally outside of God. The alienation of humans from their creator is built into the very concept of God. On the Spinozistic account, the human being is intrinsically connected with God. The fact that most of us do not experience conscious awareness of our conception or our connection with God means that for Spinoza, not that this conception uh, does not exist, but only that our present level of awareness is not sufficiently developed to experience the connection. Spinoza's philosophy aims at leading us to this experience. We now return to the first definition of God. The concept of independent being is in itself fairly obvious. An independent being is one that needs no other being or, or in order to exist. A dependent being is one that needs other beings in order to exist. How to apply this concept is less obvious. It is quite easy to see that nothing in the physical world satisfies the concept of independent being. Take one's own body, for example. It came into being in time, and hence its existence depends on things ex external to itself. Moreover, since the body can't, comes into being, its continued existence is dependent on things and processes external to itself. It would perish instantly if Earth lost its oxygen, or if the sun became extinct, and so on. But this applies to any and every object within the physical world. Everything, from a rock to a galaxy, comes into being in time and hence depends for its existence on those things and processes out of which it emerged. It might be tempting to conclude that since everything in the world is dependent on other things, then either one, the conception of independent being is vacuous, or two, the, con the concept of independent being refers to a being not in this world. But this is a false dichotomy, for it does not consider the possibility that the world as a whole might satisfy the concept of independent being. Let us now consider this possibility. The so-called causal proof for the existence of God goes roughly as follows. We assume that every event has a cause. Take any event and call it A. A will have a cause, say B. But B is also something, so it too will have a cause, say C. The original version, Aristotle's, of this argument uh, appeals to the intuition that the causal chain, which is, uh, you can see, continues to C, which causes C, or sorry, causes B, and that causes A. Uh, the ca this causal chain cannot extend indefinitely, and so there must be a first cause uh, that set in motion the whole causal chain and terminates in the event A, where God causes, and this continues on, up to C, and C causes B, and B causes A. Critics of this argument point out that the notion of an infinite causal chain which extends without limit into the past and the future is fully intelligible, and therefore the postulate of a first cause is unnecessary. That is, it could be the case, these critics argue, that the world consists of a series of events, objects, beings, each of which depends causally upon some others, which depend causally upon some others, and so on, and that there needs